Okay, guys. Uh, thank you for being flexible on this. Uh, if you hear me like go in and out, it's because like I'm moving a little bit in my chair and it's just killing my back. So let's just hope the chiropractor does his voodoo magic this afternoon and I feel better. So, all right. So we're going to talk about diversity and learning, uh, specifically how we help diverse learners in classrooms today. So what I would have talked about tonight are different dimensions of diversity, such as culture, language, gender, ability, and um, exceptionalities. So starting with culture. So the easy definition of culture, even though it's super complicated, uh, is the knowledge, attitudes, values, customs, and behavior patterns that characterize a social group. Uh, so there's a lot of different cultures out there, but remember cultures we often unfortunately define in terms of like race or ethnicity, but like there's a lot of different cultures out there and subcultures and subpopulations. And so never get caught up in thinking that you can identify a culture based on race or ethnicity. For instance, uh, like hip hop is a culture, right? So I often find myself immersed in hip hop culture, even though I am a white male from the country, essentially, um, growing up. Um, there's also different like cultures in terms of uh, like debate culture. So I teach a debate team, right? So we have people of all different races and ethnicities that make up that particular culture. So cultural diversity is uh, different cultures that you encounter in classrooms and uh, how these cultures different or difference influence learning. Um, so when you're thinking about cultural diversity, you need to also think in terms of how that can impact your classroom. So I know I just said that culture isn't made up completely of race, ethnicity, but for the purposes of looking at just diversity and backgrounds and experiences, uh, this gives us an interesting snapshot into percentages of children age 5 to 17 in public school systems uh, and their race or ethnicity. So if you look in the 2000s, obviously it was white dominated. 2010, we're seeing a little bit of a shift. And then the projections for 2020 really show... Um, you know, whites down to almost 50%, uh, and then Hispanics making up that next majority, followed by black, uh, and then Alaska, Native, Asian, and Pacific Islanders. So you're seeing um, the biggest increase from 2000 to 2020 in the Hispanic population, uh, which isn't necessarily surprising, um, but it is important for us to understand that as we go into classrooms, that the makeup is beginning to be more diverse. So let's talk about urban schools and diversity. So Right now, um, majorities of 48 of the 100 largest U.S. cities um, are cultural minorities, for instance. 90% um, of students in Chicago, Detroit, Houston, L.A., and the District of Columbia, 90% of those students technically are uh, minority students, are non-white students. So we can see that in urban settings, uh, that the diversity is obviously larger. That shouldn't necessarily be surprising. Um, and the percentage of minority students is only predicted to increase in the future, which tells us that especially if you're going to work in an urban school district such as Dallas ISD, Fort Worth ISD, even Arlington ISD, uh, you're going to see a larger makeup of diversity in your classrooms. Okay, so cultural attitudes, values, and uh, interactions. So often these are learned at home or in the neighborhood. So most of the time, things that we learn come from either our immediate surroundings in our home or people we surround ourselves with in our communities. So this will influence school both in a positive and a negative way and requires you as the teacher um, to be sensitive and to be able to adapt. I often say all the time that like, you don't know what's going on in a kid's home life, specific to either the nuclear, the nuclear family dynamic or within that community. So if you have students that are struggling with um, poverty or gang violence or uh, abuse at home or abuse of a loved one or any of those typical you know, things that could be happening, uh, you have to take those into consideration when you're talking with students, when you're giving different lectures. Uh, and then I know what you're thinking. How am I going to know that? That takes time, right? I talked the other night about um, how important relationships are to any student learning. Uh, that goes a long way here. The more you know about your kids uh, and the more they can trust you and see you as somebody who uh, is a caretaker of them, the more likely you are to get that backstory so you can really help students dig through uh, and understand um, 
that you're there for them and that can continue to build that relationship so you know how to uh, adapt uh, to their particular needs. So multicultural education. So um, typically this is looked at as different strategies that schools use to accommodate cultural differences. Um, so this is the idea that like we're a salad bowl or a mosaic rather than a melting pot. So not asking kids to all conform to uh, a particular culture or, or idea, but rather looking at them and their unique attributes that they bring to your class. So how can you do this? It's a great question. So culturally responsive teaching or CRT. Uh, CRT is a huge buzzword, especially in like multicultural education. Uh, and it's essentially instruction that acknowledges and accommodates for different uh, cultural diversities. So how do we do this, right? So how do we accept and value cultural differences? How do we accommodate different cultural backgrounds? How do we build on their cultural backgrounds? So let me throw you a few ideas right off the top. So the first thing uh, that you're gonna wanna do uh, is to acknowledge or to present diversity in various forms. So even as basic as like when you're putting together a lecture or PowerPoint, are you including images of individuals from different backgrounds? So think back to race, ethnicity, right? So do you have pictures of black students and Latino, Hispanic students, white students, males, females? Uh, what is your PowerPoint or what are you presenting to them look like? Does it have diversity in just the way you're presenting the material um, to show diversity? So that's one like quick thing you can do is a self-check in your own creation of curriculum to say, am I making curriculum that shows, that uh, illustrates visually uh, different types of people? So when we talk about language diversity, uh, there are maintenance language programs, right? So that would be like your ELA classrooms that are used and sustained like to make first language better, right? We also have immersion programs that uh, emphasize a rapid transition to English. So this is where if we have non-English speaking students, we put them in all English speaking classes uh, to immerse them into the language in hopes that they transition to using English quicker. There is a lot of data suggests that like that sink or swim method is not effective. Um, so you see it less and less. English as a second language, or as most people call it now, ELL, so English language learners, is where we focus on students' English in academic subjects. So, for instance, you may be focusing on English in your English, history, science, and math class for someone who's learning English as a second language, but in classes like mine, that's speech, that's an elective, uh, there may be more flexibility in using your native language. A transition program is where you maintain the first language uh, while students begin to learn English. So that's where your native language is uh, the first focus, uh, letting you communicate, write, etc., read in your native language, and slowly transitioning you to learn English. One of the ones that are not that I don't think I have on here is dual language programs. That would fall under bilingual education, though. So dual language programs are what we have. Um, traditionally native Spanish speakers and traditionally native English speakers, students working alongside one another so they can learn each other's languages. So there's some pilot programs here in GCISD uh, as well as in Fort Worth ISD, and I think there's even one in Arlington ISD uh, to where we have students in the elementary grades that are buddied up with someone um, where they can learn the language with one another. So bilingual education really is controversial because critics fear the loss of English um, as like the U.S. language, like traditionalists tend to like stomp on like speak American or U.S. or English or whatever because uh, this is America. The problem with that idea is like America does not officially have like like we have a primary language that is spoken, but we do not have an official language. Um, like as a country, but there are 26 states that have official English language legislation that says English is the language of that state. Um, oftentimes bilingual education is de-emphasized by No Child Left Behind, so some of the law that's still in place from there that even carried into um, the Obama era race to the top, um, there's still things that are hindering bilingual education today. Uh, proponents of it claim that it's effective, that it's humane, that it's practical, like bilingual education good, right? But critics say it's divisive, um, that it pits like culture versus culture. 
uh, that it's ineffective and inefficient. So when you think about bilingual education programs, especially those of you whose second language is English, uh, I'd be interested to know if you want to email me, uh, what was your experience with bilingual education? Like I'm always interested, especially if you went through a bilingual education program. Was it immersion? Um, you just sink or swim, transitional, pull out method, what happened uh, in your experience? So if that's you, if you don't mind emailing me, um, that'd be awesome. I'd just like to hear about that. So in ESL programs, right, we have acronyms for everything. So ESL, um, Alternative Language Services, so an ALS is where you might have a translator with you. Uh, ELL, which is an English language learner, and then LEP, ling Limited English Proficiency. Students that are LEP, you have to make certain accommodations for, uh, which we will talk about on accommodations night. Um, ELL students um, are learning the language, but they might not have an LEP, so they might know more English than for instance, someone with an LEP. And if you have someone with an ALS, you have to use whatever that service is that's being provided for them. So in talking about gender, um, so interestingly enough, like gender plays a huge role in like career choices, right? So there's this really interesting study, uh, and forgive me, I don't know the author's name by hand, but the study essentially um, the researchers went into uh, elementary classrooms and asked students to draw uh, a scientist. So draw a scientist. 88% of those drawings, roughly, were of male scientists, even by females. So oftentimes, the way we think about career choices or who can be what really is like structurally put into our society, whether we're thinking about it or not, that like, Males do certain jobs, teachers do certain jobs, or sorry, males do certain jobs like scientist, mechanic, etc. Females do certain jobs like teacher, secretary, things like that. So gender role identity creates differences in the expectation and belief about those appropriate roles. So when we think about gender role identity, um, this is something that I think in 2019 we've really progressed on, but definitely nowhere near where we need to be. So um, as we move through that, I want you to think a little bit about how you can shake that norm up in your classroom. So how are you showing different people in different careers? Are you showing males and females, you know, adequately or, you know, on level with one another, equal pay, equal work, that sort of thing? Or, um, you know, are you sticking to the stringent gender role norms? Stereotypes create that rigid and simplistic characterization of people. Same kind of thing. And then there are single gendered classrooms in schools that really separate male and female students, which the research would suggest academically doesn't do anything one way better or worse. Um, but socially, there are different um, things that happen, right? So especially with boys, that whole boys will be boys club mentality really spikes up in those all male oriented classes or schools. So let's talk about um, ability differences. So your ability to do something, right? So most people fall on this average scale, about 68%, right? It's a traditional bell curve. We've got about 2% of our school kiddos who are intellectually disabled, uh, and about 13% that are below average. About 13% are above average, and then, quote, gifted, uh, about 2%. So most of your students are going to come to you with about an average ability to do academic work. Uh, but how do we include our kids uh, that are on either side of this bell curve? So Gardner has a theory. Uh, about multiple intelligence is that says that intelligence uh, is not unitary, but it's multidimensional. And so he suggests that classrooms should attempt to develop different kinds of intelligence. Um, so there's social, there's emotional, there's academic, there's uh, artistic, there's, you know, all kinds of different intelligences. And we all may fall in different spaces on that spectrum. So for instance, um, I'm good at public speaking. I'm pretty creative. Um, I probably have more of like an artsis, artistic or artsy um, intelligence over than like a pure academic one. So if you were wanting to cater an assignment to me, you would want to shift into something that's more not necessarily hands-on, but allow some sort of creativity rather than you know strict or rigid norms. Um, there's not a strong research base on like – 
adjusting your curriculum to multiple intelligences. Um, but nonetheless, like it's important for you to think about like what type of intelligence do your students have and how can you cater to those needs? So the way Gardner lists them is linguistically. So sensitivity to the meaning and order of words. Uh, there's logical, mathematical. So this is like complex logical systems very structured in terms of steps. I like to think of this as a type A personality sometimes. Um, for my music folks, there's people with high musical intelligence, so they can understand and create music. There's spatial intelligence, right? So the ability to think in pictures, to perceive the world visually, um, highly developed artistically, architects, designers, sculptors. I would say that I fall in the spatial intelligence, but I think I lack the like pragmatic skills to like create sometimes, but I can see or think of it in pictures and know what it should look like when I'm done. So the bodily kinesthetic. Uh, so this is the people who like to mime, dance, play basketball. These are these, you know, busy bodies, kinesthetic learners. Uh, interpersonal, this is people that are good with like looking at their own moods and desires and motivation, uh, often political and religious leaders, um, therapists, those types of people. Intrapersonal, that's where you can understand your own emotions. So people that can really, like a novelist or somebody who writes like just a really rich memoir has a, a really sound intrapersonal intelligence. Uh, a naturalist is an ability to recognize uh, similarities and differences in the world. So somebody who's in this kind of worldly setting who can see the world for what it is. So how do we respond to differences in abilities? So first we can do this through ability grouping. So we have our you know kinesthetics in one group. We have our spatial in another, our interpersonal, that sort of thing. So we can group together. Uh, we can also group by ability in terms of uh, subject or um, um, strengths, so you can diversify that way too. So I know Johnny, Sally, and Sue are in one group. Johnny's good at math. Sally's good at reading. Sue's good at like naturalistic interpretations, looking at pragmatic things. That's a great group to work together because they bring different skills to the table. So how do we track this? At the secondary le level, we divide students across curriculum. So we have like GT classes, AP classes, pre-AP classes, and we tend to group them based on academic intelligence and theory. Now the difference between like your um, intelligence and then like learning style, a learning style will describe like your preferred learning method. So this is more popular in education, and researchers not so much because they think it's difficult to see it. Um, oftentimes people suggest like metacognition or students' awareness of how they learn most effectively will help them get to that point. I would argue that it's hard often for teenagers or adolescents to really uh, cognitively think about how they best learn because most of the time they're just like, kinesthetic. I like to do stuff. And I'm like, that's not everybody. So it's a little tricky. It takes a level of maturity to really understand like when you're in your element best and when you learn. Let's talk a little bit about students with uh, exceptionalities. So uh, the Individuals with Disability Act or IDEA passed in 1975 which guarantees a free, appropriate public education for all students with uh, any sort of exceptionality. So this is essentially called mainstreaming, where we try to move students from segregated, like, special ed classrooms into regular classrooms at best, the best we can. So it really was in 1975 that we saw students with disabilities get some rights under the law uh, to allow them access to education. So inclusion is the more recent and more comprehensive approach. It looks at the total systematic and coordinated school-wide system of services. So inclusion meaning uh, we include our special needs populations in all types of different things uh, that help them in their to be their best self or to, to live their best day-to-day uh, -day, um, school experience. So an LRE is the least restrictive environment. So this is where we place students in as normal as an education setting as possible. So this all depends on the level of disability of the student. So some students, for instance, in uh, will come from their special ed classroom where they've been all day to my speech classroom. Why? Because it's a least restrictive environment. They're good at social cues. Um, 
They like to talk in front of their peers or with their peers. So they could be in a gen ed classroom. <sighs> Excuse me. Uh, and don't need to stay isolated in that special education classroom. An IEP is an individualized education plan. So IEPs um, are constructed by multiple stakeholders. Student, parent, counselor, coordinator, administrators, teachers, uh, and an IEP is put in place to help students um, with an individualized education program. So what is it that's going to work best for that student? Maybe you excel in math but not in reading. So how can we adapt curriculum or give you services that allow you to be more successful in reading because that's where you're needing help? So here are the categories of disabilities under that idea encompasses that 75 Act. So I won't read all these to you, um, but some of them that jump out to me uh, on the right side column down at the bottom, traumatic brain injury. This is one of those things that can happen out of nowhere. So a kid could be rolling along fine with no IEP, nothing, uh, and then I had a student that was in a car accident a few years back and then uh, he had a TBI, so that traumatic brain injury then qualified him uh, to get an IEP to help him with his uh, learning outcomes. Okay, so looking at this chart, um, we're seeing an increasing number of students like go up this scale, um, but lower in the placement of a restrictive environment. So looking at how this flows, let's start at the bottom. Students that are placed in separate schools or residential facilities for children with special needs, that's probably the most restrictive environment. The fewest amount of students possible we try to put in that environment. Okay. Moving up to the green. Uh, student placed full-time in special ed classroom uh, in a general school. So that's where, like, if you have a special education classroom on your campus, which you will, uh, students just stay in that classroom all day. Again, we're trying to have less students in that and more in some of these others. So in the purple, a student's placed in a special education for most of the day, but they'll go to uh, gen ed classrooms um, based on their ability. So this is kind of what I see in my classroom, right? So if a kid comes to speech just for speech class, but then goes back to the special ed classroom, that's that setup. Moving up, students are placed in a general classroom for the majority of the day, and then they get special education resource for specialized instruction. Um, so this is kind of think of like a pull-out method. So for specific classes, they may go to a specialized um, classroom for that specific uh, material. Next, you have students placed in general classrooms with collaborative assistance. So I have a lot of students like this. They go to all the gen ed classes throughout the day, but they might have somebody with them, like an assistant um, or a case manager, somebody that just checks in on them as they go. And then at the top, we have students who are placed in gen ed classrooms. They just have an IEP, um, which means they just have an individual uh, education plan that teachers need to be aware of and follow um, and it could be something as simple as like make sure you give a copy of classroom notes to this particular student for whatever reason so they do everything else just like every other student um, you just need to make that one little adjustment for them and that's the way that most students tend to trend I have a lot of students with IEPs I have very few who are placed at the bottom of the spectrum in that separate um, or excuse me, in that green spectrum, that stay in the special ed classroom all day. So let's talk about students who are gifted and talented. So this is interesting because the way we identify this goes under a lot of criticism, especially like time, place, like it starts in elementary and what does that actually look like, that sort of thing. Um, but this typically is students who are at the upper end uh, of the ability or the continuum spectrum. So they need special services to potentially reach their full potential. So there's a lot of controversy around gifted and talented, especially during the No Child Left Behind era. Because again, how do we measure this? How do we test this? What do these students need? Um, some would argue that like all kids are gifted and talented, which is probably true. You just have to figure out what are they gifted and or talented at. So there are acceleration programs for uh, GT students. So um, Let's look at the enrichment options first. So an enrichment option is just a way to make GT students like more enriched in their daily go about. So independent studies or projects, 
learning centers, field trips, Saturday and summer programs, simulations and games, small group inquiry and investigation, or academic competitions. You will not be shocked to know that most of the kids on my speech team were labeled at some point as gifted and talented, thus number seven, they like that academic competition, or number five, those simulations of something. And then what are accelerated options? So ways to like move them around, move them across the education spectrum quicker, right? So early admission, grade skipping, subject skipping, credit by exam is kind of popular right now where you just take the exam and uh, if you get a certain score on it, you get credit for that particular class. College courses in high school, uh, correspondent courses. So like this goes in... Uh, is congruent with, like English 4 is congruent with English 1 at the collegiate level, so two things at once, or early admission into college. So what should you do as the teacher? Collaboration is really important. Working with other educational professionals to create an optimal learning environment. So your role is to aid in the identification process. So when you get called to a 504 and IEP meeting, you need to make sure you know about that student and what it is that they need. Uh, what do you see in your classroom? What works? What doesn't? Uh, make sure you're adapting your instruction so you're following those IEPs and 504s. Uh, and you're continually communicating with parents and stakeholders. All right, so let's look at the industry overall. So, in education, this is um, specific to who's teaching. This is teacher stats here, not student stats. So, we see clearly that almost 80% uh, of our teachers today are white. Based on gender, 78% are women or cis women. 88% are straight or heterosexual. And 92% do not have a disability. So, what does that tell us? that predominantly we have straight white females without a disability teaching our kiddos. Not necessarily that that's a bad thing, it's just a thing. And why is that important? Well, it's important because if we're showing our students one dimension of this uh, thing we call teaching, that's going to limit their ability to cognitively understand that people outside of that box can take on these roles. So we have to do a better job in education of getting diversity of teachers. Um, there's some really interesting data out there about same race teaching that shows that um, black students specifically learn better from black teachers. Uh, with whites and with Hispanics, uh, there wasn't a strong enough correlation to make that uh, determination. But we have to do a better job of getting teachers from uh, minority populations into the profession. So how can we use literacy to improve diversity awareness? One of the things that's a super easy fix to promote diversity in your classroom is to allow students uh, the opportunity to read and explore books that are about different uh, cultures, backgrounds, ethnicities, etc. Right? So here's some on the screen. Deadly Injustice Jones, so about making the team. So we have some, um, uh, I mean, just based on the cover, I assume uh, that these are African-American young men, but I could be wrong. I haven't read it. Uh, just the Way We Are, Maddie Forever, Sister Heart. It's about a lesbian couple. Um, let's see. The Great Big Book of Families. You see down the bottom right, uh, Stella's Family. So it's about having two moms. Uh, so it's really important to show diversity in the literature. Here are some others. Jacqueline, Wood, uh, Jacqueline Woodson is great about writing specifically for young black women. So what I want you to do is I want you to find a piece of literature that shows diversity and that's applicable to your content area. And I want you to post that book's title and author in Blackboard under the discussion thread. So find a book that in your subject area students could read that shows diversity. For instance, um, going back to that one a minute ago, you can't use this example, but if you're teaching PE, uh, Deadly D and Justice Jones. If you're doing a unit on football, bam, 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 right? So find something specific to your content area that shows diversity that's outside of the majority, which is, you know, white male, white female, uh, and post that title and author in the Blackboard discussion thread. 
So thank you guys for watching. I hope you got something out of this. I can answer any questions via email. Make sure you send me your literacy history papers and post this in Blackboard, uh, that book title and author. Thanks, guys.